Photography Daily. Only because we've never started with Shakespeare quoted at the head of the show. This feels like a proper grown-up podcast all of a sudden. I'd like to do just that. The voice you hear quoting is Chris Orwig. Nothing is or isn't, but thinking makes it so. Let me tell you then who Chris Orwig is. He's described as a visual artist. He's a professional photographer, a trainer, a mentor. He was on the faculty of one of America's leading photography training institutions. He's a speaker, a TEDx speaker, no less. And he's curious. I've come to see how people can shoot the same subject from the same position with the same camera and the same lens and the same light, but capture something completely different. I've always been curious, well, why is that? If a picture's worth a thousand words, then Chris is sure your photographs reveal more about you than you would think. I can look at a student's work or or a colleague or student's work, and I instantly know things about them that usually they aren't aware about themselves. We talk about what pictures need to be today to make impact, to make their presence felt in a world where we see thousands of images every day. What's become more important, I think, is to have photographs that actually have feeling, that say something, that go beneath the surface, that are more than technical. Chris Orwig's very much into the philosophy of picture making. You'll know that by listening to the first few minutes. To really begin to understand that side of him, we find out about a difficult period in his life that led to making pictures. The noise of pain and discomfort and emotionally and physically and all that um, was really loud in my life, but when I held the camera up, all that went quiet. So I'd like you to image that you've um, just enrolled on a course that attempts to unpick some of the truths about what it means to be a photographer. That's how I feel about my chats, which you'll share, of course, with Chris over the next three Thursdays. But before we start, my very important nod to the support for this photography podcast title, standing there in your your socially distanced but very present terrace supporter stands, with scarves held aloft. Uh, You, first of all, if you're a member of the Access All Areas team, when we started the, uh, the show four months ago, just emerging from one kind of lockdown into another, it was the result of having a dream. That all sounds very dramatic, I know, that it might be possible to have a daily podcast about this thing called photography that we love every day of the working week. And so, here it is. The members with your subscriptions, starting from £5 a month, that's roughly 23 pence an episode, make it possible to consider that this does indeed continue being so. Without you, for sure, it'd be weekly. A strong weekly magazine, granted, but I rather like this format. So thank you for showing your support in the arts, which at this time, as we, as I, try to make this a, a going and growing format, is really very important, and not just one of those support me calls. On that note, members, I did the first of my DMs last night, direct messages just for the members, which you should, if you see the correct logo, the yellow Access All Areas one, in your podcast player and apps like Apple Podcasts and CastBox and Overcast, should pop up in your list of new shows. It's a short five, though this is seven for the first one, minutes update on things coming up for you and a studio tour. And often it'll just be short personal messages just to keep you in touch with planning and and my thoughts about photography. To join the members area, go to the website, which is photographydaily.show and just click members. And also my sincere thanks to MPB, launched in 2011 by Matt Barker, another fledgling idea born from a desire to provide more freedom and flexibility to photographers who want to buy and sell kit. And it's become one of Europe's and America's real success stories. Matt had been using platforms like eBay and thought, hang on, I can do something that's got better functionality than this, surely, for photographers, that is. So MPB was born, the most convenient, trustworthy way to buy and sell and trade digital equipment, videography and filmmaking kit online. Sure, there's flogging a bit of kit here and there in other ways, but over 250,000 creatives in Europe and the US trust MPB for their kit needs because their security and most importantly, a six month warranty. Here we go then, Thursday, one day to the Friday photo walk. I have a feeling looking out my window at the weather at the moment, it's going to be a rainy one. But first, let me introduce my newfound friendly guru of photography, Chris Orwig. And Chris, if you're listening, I know you'll wince because you're far more modest than that description probably makes you feel. But I was introduced to Chris via a TEDx experience. He is a trainer, a mentor, a professional photographer with such a generous and genuine nature that I instantly trusted him. And really that word is so important to us, trust. 
He's not new into the art, and you'll learn why and how photography started for him in the next 15 minutes or so during this first part. But before I roll tape, as we used to say, let me read you one part of an email I'm taking out on the photo walk tomorrow from Eric Joseph in New Jersey, a listener and contributor. Glad to hear, Neil, you have Chris Orwig coming onto the show. I did his authentic portrait workshop in New York City in 2018, and it was phenomenal. I highly recommend his Authentic Portraits book for anyone looking for a really well-written dive into how to recognise genuineness of others through photography. Genuine, there's that word again. I think, Eric, you've just written the cue for my guest today, Chris Orwig. Chris, I want to start with a quote from your TEDx speech, which um, which I watch with a with a high degree of excitement. I think is the correct way to describe it. Uh, which I judge by I judge that by the number of times I said yes when you when you unleashed another photographic golden nugget. But actually, it was the first few. In fact, they are the first few words that completely had me rewrite my approach to our interview. You said. The beauty we see really is dependent upon who we are. That was my first yes moment. I would like you to elaborate on that, perhaps not in the 20 minutes, of course, as you went on to do with the TEDx experience, um, but, but, but it's a really important opening gambit for me, and I want to know what you mean by it. Yeah, I think part of that comes from, uh, you know, I think, well, I think a lot of people have said it different ways, but I like how Shakespeare said it. He said that nothing is or isn't, but thinking makes it so. As I have grown as a photographer or worked with a lot of other aspiring photographers, I've come to see how people can shoot the same subject from the same position with the same camera and the same lens and the same light, but capture something completely different. I've always been curious, well, why is that? And it does have to do with what's happening inside of us. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the simplest form, you know, when I talk with my students about it, it happens like this, you know, if I am in a bad mood for whatever reason, let's say I just, I don't know, something tragic happened or I'm frustrated with my da teenage daughter or something. If I walk down the street and I see a friend and he is stoic, I may think, man, what's his deal? Like, what's it, what's, what's, what's the problem? Uh, the next day, maybe I'm elated and I have meditated that morning and exercised for two hours and I walk by my same friend and he's stoic and I think, wow, that guy has figured something out. I mean, look <laughs> at him, like the world's crazy right now, but he has this inner yeah, peace. And yeah. so basically what we see is really dependent upon who we are. And I think beauty in particular is, is a big component of that in the sense that there are so many different beauty standards and obviously you know beauty comes from within and all these different ideas but i think if we if we lean into that a little bit more we come to discover that photography is less about standing in front of beautiful things so going to the amazing landscape or photographing the perfect model or getting your kids all dressed up so they look great for the family photo but it's and it's more about cultivating this inner perspective do you think you can tell a photographer by their image then where wh what he or she is feeling could, could could you are you honed enough now to be able to tell the mindset that they're in yes and this is i mean this may sound a little bit uh i don't know presumptuous or arrogant but i can look at a student's work or or a colleague or student's work and i instantly know things about them that usually they aren't aware about themselves wow and that is really the, I think, one of the secrets to photography is that photography is autobiographical, at least the best photographs, is always autobiographical, what's happening internally to us. And it can be as simple as what are we afraid of, what are we searching for, um, and it can be bigger things, it can be momentary lapses of judgment, it can, you know, a lot of stuff can come up. And so when I've worked with students over the years, over the last two decades, the times I've seen the biggest breakthroughs are when the student goes inward and takes the inward journey. Hmm. And it's ironic because photography is supposedly about the image, but what I often tell my students is the image is just sort of the end result. It isn't really the point. The yeah. point is what's going on in the inside, even in the sense that the best photographers have to be willing to let go of the image in order to create a good image, which is kind of like a Zen concept, I guess. Yeah. You know, you have to... 
like let's say in a portrait session, I have to be willing to say, even though I'm here on assignment and it's really important I get this picture, this isn't about a picture. This is about connecting human Mm -hmm. to human. This is about seeing someone so clearly and so deeply that I see myself in them, If even though they're different age, gender, race, religion, all these different things. Um, so I am, this is about humanity. And then if I go there and if I'm honest with myself and if there's vulnerability, a good image is made. Yeah. But it's in that order, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, it does. And I want to come back to vulnerability, actually. I've got a question about that. I wonder how, how much you've had to to almost retrain your students because uh, and it does feel to me and sometimes I feel a, well often I feel a bit guilty that I, I'm almost insta bashing but well, we live in the hectic go go swipe left world of Instagram and and I, I wonder you know when students come in particularly the younger students come in and they listen to you talk with all your experience with the years of doing it and talking about vulnerability that that you almost have to retrain them away from perfection yeah I, and I think you know I don't know if it's necessarily perfection that comes to mind, but it is, you know, maybe it's, uh, this, this may be a horrible comparison, but let me try this on for size. Maybe it's like the kid who knows that if he can throw the baseball really fast, his dad is proud. And so he becomes a pitcher and then he ends up going to the major league baseball and he's a baseball player. But then he all of a sudden realizes I, w- I was playing this for someone else, not myself. And then his career falls apart or something. So it, the, the point is, I guess that these, we get these exter- the external feedback has great power and can really affect what we create. And so on Instagram, myself included, I know certain photographs will get really good feedback, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good photograph. (laughs) Um, And I have one friend, we joke about this all the time. He's like, watch, I'm going to post this picture. It's really graphic. It's colorful, high contrast. And, you know, and he's like, watch how many likes I get. And then it's like, boom, and Instagram goes crazy. And then there's a more thoughtful, meaningful photograph. He's like, watch, this one's just going to tank. And he posts it and it tanks, you know, and we laugh. <laughs> and so I think for anyone interested in, in getting into photography, it is, yes, we do need feedback loops. We need, we need Instagram. We need it to inform us and shape us and help us think visually and critically and all those kind of things. But at the same time, we need a couple other voices as well. And if Instagram is our only feedback loop, it's a little bit dangerous. And I would say that's the same thing true for any identity issue. If, if we're, if our identity is sort of coming from one source, you know, probably, probably not the best idea, right? Um, Or if our creative identity is coming from one source. And so sometimes for me, that means um, getting input from other places. And that's what I encourage my students to do. And, and, and I, I, I tell them, you know, it's not that you need input from me, but you need it from, put from someone. Um, And maybe before Instagram was kind of like the student who would, who would get, you know, high fives from his mom and dad, like, you're amazing. And look at your photographer. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. But these photographs actually aren't good. He's like, yeah, but my mom and dad and my, you know, all these, and it's like, yeah, that's because they love you, but they're actually not good photographs. And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, let's, let's talk about it. And then, so we sit down, we talk about it and we say, well, and we, go through the conversation and then they realize and then they grow and they get some outside input. And it's not like you want to crush their spirit. We don't, a lot of times people say, you know, just give me, be brutally honest with my photographs. That doesn't do anything, any good for anyone. But what we want to do is, is, is be mindfully, thoughtfully honest. We, we want to have loving kindness in our evaluation. So you, we need those inputs as but well. We need Man, on- I, I, I'm we- talking a lot. But no, 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 <laughs> it's important. We need, we, need, we need honesty as well. I mean, Vincent Lafaray was talking to a, um, a good few weeks ago on the, uh, the show, and he said uh, he recounted a story of how he's, you may have heard this story, I don't know, but his father was a, was a, a superb photographer in Paris, and he was... Uh, um, he was um, Vincent was based in in New York. Anyway, when he saw his father, his father would uh, would separate the negatives that he'd uh, he'd made that day. He'd put uh, the in focus ones on the left and the out of focus ones on the right, and then he would take a big pair of scissors and he would thrust bang this this these scissors through the negatives of all the ones that were out of focus, and he'd said these are rubbish. They have no place. There's no purpose. No meaning in other words but that was in essence what he was saying and throw him away and vincent said that uh, even though that was quite a dramatic way to learn that that it was actually very good in terms of making him technically exceptionally proficient 
But I wonder how dramatic you have to be in your education. You were just talking about giving feedback there. I mean, how brutal do you, do you need to be? Yeah, well, you know, I taught it over for over a decade at a photography school that's no longer around called Brooks Institute. And there are a lot of stories about the school. I was talking with a friend who went there before my time and he there was one famous teacher who would hold up prints and he would burn them in front of the class, oh you know, if they, yeah. if he felt they were bad. That's every and bit then, as bad as, as putting scissors through the. Through yeah. The yeah. I was like that, but, yeah. but it's a teacher doing it to a student, you know, but then flash forward, let's say 15 years after that, there was, uh, there was another teacher there who one class he came and he, he put applications to a fast food restaurant, at everyone's desk and said, you guys better start applying because your work's horrible. <laughs> oh so, and, and, and then that kind of dissipated and disappeared. Oh, um, that yeah, is brutal. But I think yeah. The reason I'm telling that is kind of the history of, of how technical expertise has been important throughout photography. So basically it used to be that if you were technically proficient, you could get work as a photographer. So obviously you need to be expressive, but technique was king. But then now technique isn't king. I mean, my mom or right, myself, I hold up my phone, I get a technically good photograph. Like it's techniques actually easy um, to acquire. It's easy to execute. Um, I can create a really good print. I could teach someone how to create a good print, you know, in, in 10 minutes and, and, um, all these tools now really help us out a lot with that. And so what's become more important, I think, is to have photographs that actually have feeling, that say something, that go beneath the surface, that are more than technical. So I think we've, not that technique isn't important, but my daughter, for example, she, she's 16, she'll shoot with a disposable camera. All of her images, and she, she put like 50 up on her wall, are all technically horrible, but they're so beautiful and they're so raw. And they're so real. And I, I, I stand in front of her, her photo wall and just think, that's actually what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get back to that and kind of undo some of my concerns with being technically proficient. I, I feel like I've, I've, gone, I've gone zooming ahead in your career. Um, and I, I want to rewind a long way now because there was a pivotal moment for you. Were you a good skateboarder, by the way, before I posed this question? Were, were you half, half decent? <laughs> no, I wasn't. Not <laughs> no. a good skateboarder. I but I, I, I love skateboarding. I still skateboard. Well, but yeah. I, I have the advantage of looking behind. Uh, I mean, this is this is a podcast and radio in all, all effects. So, but I have the advantage of looking behind your wonderful office and seeing uh, you've lent it against a, a wall. It's almost a, it's almost a way of saying. I'm an outdoory person when you when you have a when you have a surfboard behind you, and I, I know that the skateboarding accident, which I mean, it pretty much took you out of being able to do all the things you enjoy doing. I mean, all the outdoor stuff that you did as a person when you were younger that you uh, sound like you do now still. But it was the moment the gift of a camera changed the way you defined really those things about your life, wasn't it? Your dad bought you a camera, and that changed stuff, didn't it? How? Yeah, you know, I I. <laughs> you know, as someone who really thrives in getting outdoors and being active and enjoying nature I, as a young man, you know, I think I, I related to my friends or I had friendships that were all based on activity. So it was, it was, let's go surfing, let's go skateboarding, let's go hiking, let's go biking, let's go camping, whatever it was. Right. Then all of a sudden I couldn't do that stuff. And I, I lost a lot of friendships, not by anyone's fault, but just by the nature of you know, it's kind of like the guy I used to go biking with can't bike anymore. So, so I just, what do you do? And so that then kind of spiraled into a deeper sense of identity and like, who am I? Why am I? And then also when you have a big injury, you tend to, you're obviously in that moment, but then you're also thinking forward. If it's this bad now, what it's, what's it going to be like in 20 years? And so you kind of have the weight of that burden on your shoulders. And so anyway, it was a really dark and difficult time for me. And it was in that time that my dad gave me a camera. And back then, it was a big deal to get a camera, an SLR. Um, it wasn't like you could get one at Costco. Um, you had to go to a camera store. And it was a camera I know my dad would have loved to have bought himself. But he gave it to me. And he didn't give it to me with an agenda. He didn't say, Chris, I'm giving you this as a way for you to still be creative and you know, pull, you know, get out of the gutter kind of thing. But that's exactly what happened. And part of that was the noise of pain and discomfort and emotionally and physically and all that um, was really loud in my life. But when I held the camera up, all that went quiet. 
And I think it still is why I take pictures today. It's, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm in search of that silence and that presence and that awareness and that depth and that scene beneath the surface and actually pausing, slowing down. And it also helped me to heal because it helped me to, how do I, how do I put it? Help me to realize that, um, I guess when you know when you have an injury or, or something bad goes wrong, let's just say I'm just going to make something up. But let's say you you step on a piece of glass at the beach or something. Your your foot hurts. What you do is you focus inward, and all of a sudden the whole universe just becomes about this cut on your foot. It, and rightly so. That's pain's job. Pain's job is to say pay attention to what's just happened and do something about it. But that can also be, inc- you can become s- incredibly self-absorbed yeah. and the universe becomes about you. The camera helped to flip that and say, oh my gosh, the world is so big. There's so many people who struggle with things which are much more significant than myself. I have so much to be grateful for. And so it starts that gratitude engine up because that's really what photography is in a way. It, it is a way to see and to be grateful for the sunset. Like, why does everyone pull out their camera at the sunset or the music or the food? They're just like, wow, this is, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm so excited. I'm, I'm just so in love with whatever this is. And, and that's a whole nother tangent. But um, anyway, <laughs> the camera helped me to heal yeah. and is amazing. Still helps me to heal. And I still turn to it for those reasons. Well, I hear people often talking about the, the healing powers of, of that, that box in your hand. Um, I've spoken to photographers who've suffered greatly through, well, with, with PTSD, for example, who say that they feel entirely different the moment they they become disengaged from, well, what you were describing, this or the universe all being about them, and they, they're looking through the, the eyepiece and into a scene. Have you, have you noticed uh, any of your students that that's been particularly helpful for as well? Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't necessarily say, I can't think of any examples of students who have um, gone through, let's say, an injury or an accident. But I would say that it has helped them to heal through other issues they're facing in life. And maybe just to talk more specifically or personally rather than tell their stories my own. I would say for a while, I pursued doing portraiture because I would try to see who someone really was, see their inner light, see their inner strength, their beauty, whatever it was, in hopes that they would see my inner light, my inner beauty, my inner strength, yeah. which, which, which is fine. You know, that's a nice collaborative idea, except that I was hoping that they would say, accept me in a way that I hadn't yet accepted myself. And that process of capturing portraits helped me realize that and realized, oh, you know what? Before I can ask someone else to extend grace or acceptance to me, I need to do that to myself. And so that healing was very different than, let's say, dealing with pain. That healing was more dealing with identity, self-rejection, and coming to appreciate and accept myself in a way I hadn't. My thanks to Chris Orwig, and he returns next week on Thursday, for the next two Thursdays. And that's it for today. Tomorrow is the Friday Photo Walk. Me, your emails, uh, I think a raincoat, and a chance to make some pictures as we walk and talk together. Today's show was kindly supported by MPB, trading thousands of cameras and lenses every week across Europe and the US. They check and they grade and photograph every single item and add in that six-month warranty so you can be sure what you find in the box. My thanks also to you in the supporters' members area. Music in the show was from artlist.io and I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you tomorrow. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.